In 2012, a ruthless and feared gangland criminal, Dale Cregan, murdered four people in cold blood in Greater Manchester. Just an absolutely despicable act, one of pure evil. I've never come across anybody who could be so callous and so cold. In the space of four months, this killer's rampage was so violent and unpredictable, it sparked a nationwide manhunt. We had grenades, which had not happened before in that sort of attack. What started as a feud between two rival Manchester gangs. They were taking down posters in and around the Droylsden area, saying that if you grasp to the police, you will not live long enough to spend £50,000. Ended with two female police officers being brutally murdered. This was the first time that two female police officers had been killed on duty in mainland Britain. With a hoax call to police that lured the innocent women to their deaths. Someone just threw a big concrete slab through me that window and ran off. If you're feeling numb, you're feeling shocked, you're feeling anger, you name it, every emotion you can think of is going through your head. We're just ordinary people. We are just ordinary people. Dale Cregan was born in Tameside, Greater Manchester, in 1983. His life of crime started at an early age, when he apparently began dealing cannabis while he was still at school. By the time he reached his early 20s, he allegedly developed a strong interest in weapons, particularly knives, and was earning large amounts of money from dealing cocaine. Having spoken to a number of people that knew Cregan as he was growing up, I think it is fair to say that signs were there that this was an individual that was going off the rails. Cregan built a reputation in his community through intimidation. With a distinct appearance, he bragged about losing one of his eyes in a street fight. There were some, um, some pretty horrendous acts of violence that he had engaged in, not using firearms, but, um, but using other weapons, um, which to ordinary human beings would be absolutely ab abhorrent and unthinkable, which gives you an indication of, of the kind of mind and individual that we were dealing with. Cregan moved to a town called Droylsden in Greater Manchester and straight onto the turf of local gang leader David Short. Before long, tensions brewed as Cregan allegedly became an enforcer for a rival family, the Atkinsons. A turf war began which saw unprecedented levels of violence, including people being shot at, run over and stabbed. A dangerous feud that ultimately became deadly in 2012. He started off uh, from a dispute between two families, but a dispute which had a, a long history of animosity as well. Often, perhaps, the public isn't fully aware of how actually a lot of crime is generated um, by crime groups who create the market in stolen goods, create the market in drugs, um, who get involved in all forms of illegal activity. Power bases, through their threats, through their intimidation, through their reputation, will try and rule areas, intimidate areas, uh, and almost you know, try and create an alternative economy um, and an alternative almost criminal justice system. The violent history between the two families had allegedly ended in a truce in 2003, but nine years later erupted once more. It started from uh, a dispute over a woman and an argument over a woman. If somebody had made an advance towards somebody that that person had not taken them up on that particular offer, that was seen as disrespect. And uh, we do believe that uh, she allegedly had said she was going to get the boys to sort this out. Twelve days later, on the 25th of May, this argument led to a fatal outcome. 23-year-old Mark Short was at the Cotton Tree pub in Droylsden, Manchester, with his friends and family. Just before closing time, a masked gunman entered the pub. Mark Short and his friends were targeted with a hail of bullets. I remember quite distinctly, it, was, uh, it had been a long day and I'd driven home and I'd literally arrived home um, when the phone rang to say that there'd been a murder. I think the gunman was in and out of the pub in under a minute. It was around 24 seconds. Mark Short was shot in the chest. Three other people 
uh, were shot in that pub and by chance David Short was in the toilet at the time the gunman came into the pub. Uh, he came out to find a, a scene of absolute devastation and Mark Short died there in his arms. The murder had clearly been seen by a number of other customers in the pub, but they refused to talk to the police. Because they're talking about people that were in criminal associations that were largely the witnesses um, who did not want to speak to the police, uh, where clearly steps had been taken to uh, obviously cover the tracks of those who had committed the attack, um, uh, and that it was a very, very difficult investigation. Rumours also began to circulate that Mark Short had been killed by accident and that the murderer was looking for someone else. With some witnesses to the crime potentially aiding the suspect, the police could not rely on their statements. So they turned to evidence and a call from a member of the public. First of all, we, we, we had on CCTV the vehicle that was used in the Cotton Tree murder, um, and that was caught on CCTV. That was abandoned and burnt out some time, uh, some distance away. Um, but there was clothing that was left um, near the area of that vehicle being abandoned, and, um, and we had information that that clothing had been dumped. We didn't know at that time, and nor did the person that called us, uh, that that was a clothing that had been used uh, by the offenders in this particular case. But it was from that clothing that we were able to pick up some of the DNA traces that led us to ultimately to Cregan and his associates. Well, what we understand is that there is a long-standing feud between um, the uh, Shorts and the Atkinsons. And actually, Cregan was part of, um, we believe, part of Atkinson's. He was hired muscle, if you like, for, for the Atkinson family. I suppose we will never know the, the truth if that is right, to think that that was the start of a chain of events that led to the murders of two police officers. I think it is a, it's a sad indictment on society. The way these things work is that often, you know, the people clearly who uh, are tasked with carrying out the violent attack have not been, uh, you know, originally directly involved um, in that first incident which showed the disrespect. Um, and that's obviously one, you know, a means of uh, distancing um, you know, the, uh, the people who've commissioned the attack from those who actually carry out the attack. And that's often, again, what makes these sorts of investigations quite difficult. Rumours of Dale Cregan working for the Atkinson family had been in the community for a while. But despite having a reputation as an enforcer, he wasn't known for this level of violence. I think, to be fair, in my, my service in the police, you, you can see these people that engage in low to moderate level violence. And I think, to be fair, there, there comes a tipping point where they will then engage in something that takes them over the edge, where actually it's easier to carry on than it is to try and come back. Well, Cregan was, uh, was known to the police anyway. Um, he has a long criminal history, so he was well known to us. It was not top of the pile, so there was quite a lot of intelligence about him um, and clearly these two families were very well known about, but uh, on the whole, I mean, it wasn't particularly active or particularly high on the, on the radar. Police studied the material they now had in an attempt to link Cregan to the attack. After the shooting, he had quickly left the country, but on his return to the UK, officers were waiting to arrest him. They finally had a key suspect in custody, but believed other people had also helped in the crime. Investigations continued into at least four other men known to Cregan. We were always very worried um, that there could be further attacks. Um, the sort of challenges we had uh, was clearly, number one, finding the people responsible, um, people who are highly skilled in covering their tracks, who will have a wide you know, a web of associates um, who will protect them. We then had a huge number of people who were potentially at threat um, because, you know, we didn't know who next within the, 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 the criminal associations would then be targeted. So there was an enormously difficult situation um, of literally hundreds of people uh, on both sides of this dispute who are now at risk, um, who had to be warned about their risk, uh, and in certain situations had to be protected. What had begun as a small-scale dispute between two families had turned into one of Greater Manchester Police's largest investigations. And Cregan, one of their main suspects, was about to become a free man. We couldn't, at that point, get sufficient evidence together 
um, which would have then uh, enabled the Crown Prosecution Service uh, to have then charged them. Um, and that is what, why they were then let out on bail. And, and that is, uh, whether we like it or not, a common occurrence. A young father's death increased tension in the community, but officers had to release Dale Cregan from police custody without charge. However, their investigation into two other associates of his led to their arrests. 27-year-old Luke Livesey from Hattersley and 38-year-old Damien Gorman from Glossop were charged with the murder of Mark Short and three attempted murders on his friends. Police believed they finally had their suspects in custody until another gruesome attack occurred. On the 10th of August, the father of the murdered man, 46-year-old David Short, was outside his house in Clayton, Greater Manchester. Ten weeks after the attack on the pub, uh, David Short was unloading some furniture from his car uh, when he was shot at ten times with a Glock pistol uh, and a military uh, M75 hand grenade, a Yugoslavian military hand grenade, was used against him. And after the autopsy, a report revealed that it caused such severe tissue damage that there was just no way he would uh, have ever survived those injuries. The series of incidents were shocking in terms of, you know, the level of violence um, which was used. Um, you know, the fact that we had grenades used, um, you know, which you know, had not happened before in that sort of attack, um, really in the British mainland in that way. That said, you know, organised crime groups are about using extremes of violence. That's how serious criminals rule the roost. The use of grenades uh, created huge challenges for us in terms of how our firearms officers were then going to be able to um, you know, capture somebody who potentially was able to use that type of weaponry. Uh, and I remember uh, vividly seeing an image afterwards of a van that was used in that attack. Um, the, the side of the van, the, the roof, um, was absolutely peppered with holes from the shrapnel of one of these military hand grenades. So anybody anywhere near one of them would have stood absolutely no chance. But that image of that van uh, sticks in my head and I think at that point I realised just how dangerous this man was. Once the, the second murder occurred, we then realised that we had some significant issues that uh, we had to deal with very, very quickly. Well, David Short survived the attack on the pub uh, in which Mark Short was killed. Uh, Greater Manchester Police then issued three threat to life warnings to David Short, and they clearly believed that his life was in grave danger at that isn't something that's taken lightly, uh, but on three occasions they told David Short that they believed there was a credible threat to his life. Sadly, we are not unfamiliar with gang land type murders, uh, and often with these murders it is gang members shooting each other using traditional or conventional firearms. The difference with this one was the, uh, the use of hand grenades. The use of military grenades was not something the force had seen before and wasn't a readily available weapon. In just weeks, a father and son had been murdered in cold blood. As police built the evidence from this crime scene and pieced it together with intelligence from Mark Short's murder, certain suspects' names were prominent again, one being Dale Cregan. In terms of how we got him and linked him to uh, these offences, it was through forensics, first of all, how we actually got uh, the link there. But secondly, there was, a, there was an incident moments after he'd murdered David Short, literally moments after he went to an address in Luke Road um, and was caught on CCTV with, we believe, the firearm that um, he used to kill David Short. And the CCTV footage also caught him taking the pin out of the grenade and throwing it at an address in Luke Road. What started off as this, um, you know, supposed disrespect for a woman then had escalated, um, you know, to people being shot in the pub uh, and then to grenades being used. Uh, it was an extremely unusual and, and clearly violent event. Before police could arrest Cregan, he fled and went into hiding, sparking an urgent nationwide hunt. It was clear that this dangerous man had a large network of people working with him and willing to protect his whereabouts. One of these people was an associate called Anthony Wilkinson, who had disappeared at the same time. 
It was a very complex investigation because we now had somebody that we knew was on the loose. We knew that uh, he was capable of using hand grenades, which had never been seen before in mainland UK. Um, he was not afraid to kill, murder, or maim. The sort of challenges we had um, was clearly, number one, finding the people responsible, um, people who, again, are highly skilled in covering their tracks, who will have a wide you know, web of associates um, who will protect them um, and find them accommodation and move them to other parts of the country, whatever it might be. Um, people who are extremely aware of the tactics that we use uh, and extremely skilled in trying to frustrate them. With advice from the military, we knew that they had a kill range of 50 metres and a maiming range of 100 metres. Potentially, we still have these hand grenades possibly in Cregan's possession, and we'd seen the level of violence that he was prepared to use. My fear was you throw one of these grenades into, into a public house, into a nightclub, into a police carrier, you have killed everybody. It was the level of weaponry that was now available and on the streets of Manchester, which was, which was frightening and, I have to say, kept me awake at night. Cregan at that point was identified as a national threat, but in terms of getting national coverage, part of the challenge we had was that at that time it was the Olympics, so all the media focus was on the Olympics, quite understandably. I think it's fair to say that, uh, that Cregan was quite savvy, but he was, um, he was being supported by even uh, more savvy um, criminal individuals. Uh, and so some of the techniques that he was using to avoid detection, so for example, um, using phones once and, and throwing that phone away and buying another phone, communicating through different channels, whether it's through games consoles or whatever, he employed a number of techniques and was advised by others using those various techniques that, um, that made it very, very difficult for us to actually track uh, where he was or where he was going to be. Officers believed Cregan and Wilkinson could be on the run together. Suspecting that they could be responsible for two murders and have the use of such destructive weapons, the police came up with an unprecedented tactic to try to catch them. At the time in 2012, it was, of course, the London Olympics. They were dominating uh, the news agenda, but certainly locally uh, in the northwest, there was uh, a growing concern and attention uh, that there was a, clearly a very dangerous man here. And I think it became increasingly clear, certainly over the course of, of that August, that police were particularly keen to, to track him down and take him into custody. The first reward discussed was, was £25,000. I recognised pretty quickly that uh, £25,000 would not be enough to surrender this individual, I think mainly because of the fear that was in the community. The reward was actually up to £50,000. I remember having a conversation saying, you're going to have to do something which is unprecedented too in terms of reward. This is going to have to be life-changing. Let's say it's a million pounds. Because I remember my uh, officers coming in and saying that uh, they were taking down posters in and around the Droylsden area, saying that if you grasp to the police, you will not live long enough to spend £50,000. The posters that were being put up was indicative of the kind of fear that existed within that community, so we had to do something which was, which was pretty unique. Well, a reward in this country is rare, uh, but this was particularly rare in that it was being offered not for the conviction of Dale Cregan, but merely for his arrest. Uh, and it was also only to be given to somebody who called Crime Stoppers uh, with information uh, that, of course, led to the arrest of Dale Cregan. So it was very clear uh, very quickly uh, that the police were very keen to track him down uh, and to take Dale Cregan into custody. £50,000 was eventually agreed, in the hope that somebody would lead officers to Cregan and Wilkinson's whereabouts, and time was running out. With little information still coming forward, they took the extraordinary step of putting on display £50,000 cash, their biggest ever reward. One anonymous phone call to Crime Stoppers, that's all it's going to take, and we will pay you £50,000 for that information which leads to the arrest of Cregan and Wilkinson. Now the threat had escalated to an incredible proportion that we had over 100 people that we considered now to be at risk because of the links with these gangs. Over 100 people that we considered were going to be the next target. 
Because of the high risk to the public, police struggled to protect the sheer number of people who could potentially become the killer's next victim. And despite the substantial reward, the local community remained silent. Cregan and Wilkinson were nowhere to be found, but there was a breakthrough. Another suspect, 24-year-old Jermaine Ward, was arrested and charged with David Short's murder. However, police were confident that he hadn't acted alone and needed to find the other dangerous men quickly. There was a lot of pressure put on various associates, family members. Clearly, there was a huge number of rumours circulating. There was material on social media. Um, even to this day, there are people who will tell you that they knew where he was. Um, you know, we know that's untrue. It does show clearly um, that if you are determined um, to evade the police, if you are pretty skilled um, in some of those evasion techniques because of your previous criminal history, because of what you've been able to pick up about police tactics each time they, when you were arrested and convicted, because material is disclosed to you in the court process, um, then clearly that is an enormous challenge for policing and for law enforcement in general. Clearly we've examined a lot of our tactics since. You couldn't go into Manchester city centre without seeing Dale Cregan's image. So his image was plastered across billboards. I remember vans with screens were being driven around uh, with that uh, appeal for information and, and Dale Cregan's uh, very distinct image uh, on these posters. Despite a national appeal, a hunt involving many police forces in the UK and a reward for tens of thousands of pounds, weeks went by with no leads on Cregan or his associate, Anthony Wilkinson. He was on the run with, uh, with Anthony Wilkinson. We knew that he had a number of people that um, had assisted him in, this, in the preparation of this crime and committing crimes. And so we had all of those, uh, those individuals that we were, we were looking for as well. The search for both men stretched across the UK and Europe, but they still evaded capture. Until three weeks after David Short's murder, one man finally surrendered. It was fair to say that after Anthony Wilkinson surrendered himself to custody, that uh, Cregan was the main player. He was the one that we feared would create the most um, problems for the communities and would create most problems for us. We've been under huge pressure, you know, it was 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We put into, a, you know, put into place a number of measures uh, in terms of trying to, um, you know, quantify the risk. We had a lot more armed officers, we had armed officers from other parts of the country, but what we clearly couldn't do is just abandon normal policing. Five weeks after Dale Cregan had gone missing, Greater Manchester Emergency Services received a phone call from a member of the public complaining about damage to his property. Someone just threw a big concrete slab through me that window and ran off. Were you in the room where it came through or did you hear the bang? No, I was upstairs, I looked out the window and seen one by running off. Is it a kitchen window that's gone through? Yeah, kitchen. Local police constables Fiona Bone and Nicola Hughes were asked to go to the caller's aid. They'll try and get up there as soon as if there's a possibility he's still knocking about. All right then, thanks very much. Okay. I'll wait there. I'll be waiting. With the hindsight of knowing what that call was, uh, it's incredibly chilling to know that that was a, a man luring police officers to their deaths. He knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, those police officers couldn't have had any idea of the danger that they were about to put themselves into. Uh, but the end of that call was, was absolutely chilling. The two young officers drove just three miles from Hyde Police Station to the address in Hattersley. So 10 o'clock, um, I was sat in the room uh, chairing the meeting and we were discussing just various things around uh, police in the division and there was no knock on the door, the door just literally burst open and um, one of the detectives from the CID or from the uh, investigative teams within Tameside was stood at the door and he just said, uh, boss you better come out, there's something happening at Hyde. And he didn't really know uh, what it was and I, I didn't know what, what, what it was but you could see that there was something significant who was saying, I think it's something to do with Cregan. 
and um, and I turned the, the the radio on, hoping that this was just real positive news. I mean, in my mind, I was thinking this is this is good news, you know, that um, we've we've caught him or he's handed himself in or whatever. The police radio took just a few seconds to uh, to fire into life, and um, uh, and as it did, the. Um, The, uh, the words that came over the radio, I'll never forget. <clears throat> and it was simply, it was, uh, it was one of the sergeants who was saying, they're shot, uh, sh sh they're shot, get an ambulance, get an ambulance. And I remember thinking, it, that, that just doesn't make sense. And the radio came on, I heard the radio operator at the same time trying to call a call sign of Golf Mike 41, Golf Mike 41, which was Nicola and Fiona's call sign because the call taker had obviously realised that those officers had gone to an address in that area but I don't think had made the link at that point and I certainly hadn't made the link. The police operator got no response from the two officers. And I remember saying to the sergeant, what's, uh, what's going on? And, uh, and he just said, she's dead, she's dead. And I remember trying to, uh, to speak to him and saying, who's dead? And the phone went, went off. And um, I, rang the call back, I rang the phone back immediately and, um, and it was the inspector this time that answered the phone. And he said, Fiona's dead. And uh, we're working on Nicola now. and opened the door and immediately began firing this Glock 9mm weapon at uh, Fiona and Nicola. Um, it didn't, no words were exchanged, he just simply started firing with this extended magazine on this weapon. Fiona tried to use her taser gun to stop Cregan, but neither woman stood a chance. Despite colleagues rushing to help, Fiona lost her life at the scene, whilst colleagues desperately tried to save Nicola. Before the help arrived, the perpetrator fled the scene, leaving the victims to die. We've then got Cregan, who'd driven to uh, to Hyde Police Station and had handed himself in. Did he have hand grenades on him? Was that police station now going to get blown up with hand grenades? Was the vehicle that he was in, was that booby-trapped with these grenades? Did he still have the weapon on him? As an officer rushed to arrest the murderer, the enormity of the situation was taking hold. I've got one officer that an inspector is telling me is dead. I've got another officer that they're saying is working on. That was Nicola. What did working on mean? It seemed that I was just stood there forever and almost as if I was, I was looking down on the situation. And I feel in a way quite, quite annoyed at myself about that um, because you would think that you would know what to do. But I've said this many a time. We're just ordinary people. We are just ordinary people. I was driving home and then a phone call came up and it was an unknown number on, on my hands free in the car. And it was this, uh, a DCI from Manchester. Um, and he said, I need to speak to you. And then I, I, I could sense in his voice there was something. And I said, what, why, what's happening? He says, where are you? I said, I'm driving home from work. I'd seen Nicola the night before. Um, and I thought she said to me, I'm off for five days now. But she said, I'm on for five days now. Obviously, I miss her. He said, where are you? I'll come and get you, I'll come and get you. And he said, you know, there's no easy way of saying it. And he didn't actually say the words, but he just said, there's no easy way of saying it. And then the next, what, two or three miles of, I don't know, a blur, a nightmare. 23-year-old Nicola Hughes lost her life in hospital, despite desperate attempts to save her. Nicola and Fiona were available to take the call because they were on duty that day. Um, they took the call and, and because of it, they lost their lives. As Nicola's family tried to process the devastating news, police rushed to contact Fiona's parents, 150 miles away on the Isle of Man. We were sitting, having lunch, <laughs> and uh, we put the news on. 
and the headlines were two police women had been killed in Manchester. And fairly vague, but hey, Fiona's a police woman in Manchester. Oh, should I give her a ring? Should I not? And then there was a knock on the door. <laughs> um, and that was it. <laughs> um, so I opened the door to a police sergeant and a nice young police lady and I said, you may as well come in then. <laughs> because um, we knew what it was about as soon as they opened the, well, knocked on the door. It was literally seconds of pre-warning. It really wasn't long. We were obviously fairly shocked, but, I mean, their faces were quite, you know, this is not the news we wish to bring. <laughs> We'd called all of the team back in off the streets and they were all sat in, um, in the uh, canteen at uh, Ashton Police Station. And we walked into the, uh, into the canteen and they were all sat there. And, and you know, as you can imagine, you could hear, a, you could have heard a pin drop. And uh, we had to obviously give the news and the, and the devastation that that created, that they just, just then to be informed that they'd lost two of their colleagues on, you know, what had been just a, a call to a, re a routine burglary or damage. Just, just the level of grief in that room was, was, was palpable. And, uh, and then, of course, you've got to offer them the support. Clearly, they couldn't go back on, onto the streets. Gradually, the horrific news started to make the headlines across the country as everyone tried to absorb the magnitude of what had happened. This morning, a week after the sad deaths of Nicola and Fiona, we held a vigil close to the place where they were attacked. It was great to see so many colleagues attend, but also particularly so many ordinary members of the public of the communities of Haddersley and Mottram. I think it absolutely horrified the nation because this was the story of two young female police officers who were unarmed. Uh, they attended what they believed was a routine call out and because of it, they lost their lives. It's difficult to describe how how you feel. Obviously, if you're feeling numb, you're feeling shocked, you're feeling anger, you name it, every emotion you could think of is going through your head. I think it's just so easy going. I think that was one of the, one of the massive qualities that she was really easy going. She was so wise, she was intelligent, witty. She moved to Manchester, where she became a special. And she enjoyed being a special three or four nights a week, or whatever it was she did and she really liked it. So from the special, she tried joining the police force and eventually she did. She liked it. Anything that was a bit risky, dodgy, or could upset anyone wasn't told to us. We only got to hear the good bits. As the country was left reeling from the multiple murders, Fiona and Nicola's colleagues still had the burden of investigating the crime and piecing together Cregan's movements before the attack. And what came to light was more chilling than they expected. Cregan held these people hostage with threat of murdering them and blowing up the daughter and all the rest of it. He allowed the occupant to go to work that morning, but had threatened to kill his, his partner and, and child if he had called the police. Cregan reportedly had said he was sorry that it was women and he wished it had been men. I want to make the point that Cregan saw those officers walking towards that address and had a number of opportunities not to engage with those officers. And if you look at Nicola, who was 23 at the time, who just looks like a child, and Fiona, who was five foot nothing, you could see that these were two individuals that actually were not going to pose much of a threat to him in any case. So this business about wishing that it had been men is nonsense. If it hadn't been Nicola and Fiona, it would have been somebody else. Nicola wasn't normally crewed with Fiona, so that was purely random. Um, and it was just bad luck. Wrong place, wrong time. The loss of both women brought the country to a standstill. Another reminder of the incredible risks and the great work our police service does. And my thoughts, and I think the thoughts of the whole country, uh, will be with their families uh, at this impossibly difficult time. You expect your, your children to plan your funeral. You don't expect to plan your own children's funeral. So it was really strange. 
two weeks on from the murders, mourners line the streets of Manchester to pay their respects to Fiona Bone and Nicola Hughes. I mean, it was a horrendous occasion for me, but support we had leading up to it and then on the day, it made you, it, you soaked it up, you soaked the energy up from people, even though it was a sad occasion, obviously. It felt like the country stopped, certainly Manchester came to a stop. And I can't tell you what it meant for our officers, just the, uh, number one, the enormous support from our colleagues. We were taken to Manchester Cathedral a few days earlier just to see the, what the cathedral looked like and meet the principal people conducting the service. And we thought, how are you going to fill this place? It's fast. <laughs> and that came as quite a shock. <laughs> the sheer number of people when you, you got outside the cathedral and all those people standing bowing their heads was amazingly uh, humbling. I remember on the day of the funerals, it was just desperately sad. I'd never seen Manchester come to such a standstill, and I think it was at that moment that it became clear that this had affected uh, two families in that their lives uh, would never be the same again, but also uh, the wider police family. As Fiona and Nicola were laid to rest, their colleagues struggled to cope with the tragedy. I felt so responsible for their deaths, and still do. You try to reassure the public that you can keep them safe and look after them, and yet I was unable to do that for my own. The divisional commander tried to resign, but was eventually persuaded to stay in his position. In four months, four innocent people had been murdered on the streets of Manchester. Those believed to be responsible, Dale Cregan and a number of his associates, had yet to be punished for their crimes. Cregan gave himself up. He didn't want to be killed. Um, and then there was an enormous investigation, um, and people may think, well, that's easy, you know, it's obviously him that did it, but you then obviously have to prove the whole sequence. We had to try and find out where he had been, who had sheltered him, who had supported him, um, all the other criminal associates that had been involved in the case, um, so there was an enormous investigation. The level of security surrounding Dale Cregan's trial was unprecedented. He pleaded not guilty to any of the murders. There were armed officers routinely deployed. Uh, there were armed officers on the roofs of nearby buildings and around the court. And it was clear that police were under no illusions just as to how dangerous this man was. Two weeks into the trial, Dale Cregan decided to change his plea to guilty uh, for the murder of the two police officers. Dale Cregan said that he murdered the two police officers because his family had been hounded uh, over the months that he was being sought for the murders of Mark and David Short, uh, and that this was his way of exacting revenge. As the trial continued, he also changed his plea to guilty for the murders of Mark and David Short. And after 19 intense weeks, the jury found him guilty of all four murders. Well, at the end of the trial, Dale Cregan was handed a whole life tariff. Now, that's not something we see frequently. Cregan was given the most severe prison sentence available in the UK. And the other suspects, Luke Livesey and Damien Gorman, received life in prison for murdering Mark Short and the attempted murder of three of his friends. Jermaine Ward and Anthony Wilkinson were found guilty and given life sentences for their part in the murder of David Short. If you take someone's life, then you, you deserve, you know, for the rest of your life, you're, you're incarcerated, you're locked up. And that's why I, I think if I, if I focused on that person, it eats away. It's like, it's like taking poison open yourself and open their dying, they don't. Cregan has shown no remorse for his crimes since the murders. But despite the trauma suffered by the families, lasting legacies were formed in Fiona and Nicola's names. You've got two choices in there. You can, you can either give up, you can either go and hide yourself away, or you can carry on. 
you can, you can pull yourself... And I know what Nicola said, she said, pull yourself together, carry on, get up and do something. I needed something as a challenge for myself, and, and I, we, there, was, there was three charities that helped us in, in the early stages, and I, I wanted to give them something back. Um, so I thought I'd run a marathon for that. In March 2014, Bryn established the Nicola Hughes Memorial Fund to give support and skills to young people who have suffered a tragic loss. So we thought, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do things to help them practical lives. We'll pay for driving lessons for them, we'll pay for school shoes, because, let's face it, if, if, if Dad's murdered, family incomes, it could be gone, it could be wiped out. And a lasting tribute was also paid to Fiona. A building was named in her honour. When we found out, we said, yes, that's a wonderful thing. And they invited us across to lay the foundation stone. Uh, Fiona would have enjoyed Fiona Gardens. She did uh, Duke of Edinburgh's Gold Award as a care assistant in a care home on the Isle of Man. I think you've just got to remember the good times. You can't dwell on the bad things. You, you can't do anything about the person who's died. In the evening, we'd possibly ring each other, and I really miss those phones incredibly hard not to do it. And I was finding myself in tears going along bits of road for no apparent reasons, you know. But I really do miss Fiona. <laughs> yeah, and nobody to play with anymore. And nobody to take me out drinking when they shouldn't, things like that. <laughs> I still remember us laughing her head off and, and, you know, being friendly and, and practical jokes and jumping on me when she sees me and everything else. So that's how I remember Nicola.